Greetings. My name is Nate Angel, and I am uh, calling in today from Portland, Oregon, where it's actually sunny for once. Uh, every day there's a little different thing going on here. It's usually raining, but today it happens to be sunny. I don't know what, what we did wrong. Um, and uh, I am also a uh, <clears throat> uh, grateful but uninvited guest on uh, indigenous territories that we call Nichiwana here, the, the land of the Great River and the Multnomah Valley, where many different indigenous peoples have long called this their home. Uh, and I am really pleased today to get to our actually third hands-on open learning tools session today on OER Commons um, with <clears throat> Mindy Boland, who I'm actually just meeting for the first time, I believe, today. I don't think we've met before. We have met in an open ed like many years ago. <laughs> That's entirely possible. It's yeah. entirely possible. That happens to me a Back lot. Back when and we saw each other in person. <laughs> yes. And maybe if I we, I saw you in person, I would actually yeah. recognize you and remember. But um, but at any rate, um, and so we're going to be focusing in on uh, the work of OER Commons and all the surrounding goodness of that today. Um, and <clears throat> uh, in addition to that, I one of the things that I love to hear about uh, in these um, open learning journey sessions is um, kind of a little bit about how we all got started down this path. There's so many different ways that we ended up here. Um, <laughs> and yet here we all are. We often find each other. Um, I mean, pretty much everyone here uh, is a recognizable face that I know um, already, but I don't know exactly how you got here. And so I thought I'd pose that question to Mindy mm -hmm. uh, for starters and just um, hear a little bit about how you got started with open learning and open learning tools and OER Commons and all that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I actually spent most the much of my career now it's not as much of it as, as I get older, but um, <laughs> about 15 years working um, at what was initially Wadsworth publishing, then Thompson learning, then Cengage learning. So I started out in textbook publishing editorial and kind of moved from there into media development and e learning tools um, working there when um, they laid off the entire product management team, <laughs> I left Cengage and um, started working first for Stanford Libraries at Highwire, which is a, they had a platform for um, open access journals that I worked on and, and, their, and developed an ebook platform with them. And um, then Stanford spun them off and I got laid off there. And um, I knew about OER and I knew about OER Commons and I, realized that ISCME, the organization that I work for, was based near me in Half Moon Bay, California, and um, started kind of investigating the work that they do and got really excited about just their approach to open education and learning more about it. Coming from editorial, I kind of wanted to be able to pass that sort of empowerment on to educators to be able to build, you know, their own tools and adapt resources themselves and really help work on that tool set. So, about six or seven years ago, I started stalking Lisa Petridis, our CEO, and uh, <laughs> started working as a contractor with ISKME, originally just hired to um, make OER Commons responsive for mobile devices, which turned into a redesign, which turned into a new career path for me. So um, now as the Vice President of Services at ISKME, uh, my team and I run OER Commons as well as all of the um, individual instantiations of my OER commons that we develop. So we, we call them micro sites. They're not that micro, but they are often um, developed for state agencies, state departments of education, higher ed library consortia systems, um, community college systems, high four year systems. So we've also done some um, Ministry of Education's uh, more globally. And then we also have the hubs on OER Commons, which are kind of, we call them wings in the library, where folks can kind of have their own space of OER Commons, and I'll show you these today. So we continue to uh, try and push the envelope, making OER discoverable, and really are trying to, I, we used to always talk about breaking down silos, you know, because OER is so pocketed, and just thinking now in terms of more about how we can connect silos, how we can make things findable, but understanding that OER is created in these smaller spaces, and we just want to make it discoverable for everyone. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the end here, just sort of directionally where we want to go, but um, I really want to focus today on how to use OER Commons and, and what you can get out of it. So. Um, That's right. Hey, but, but, and before we kick that off, Mindy, um, 
uh, which I think is a great direction to go. Um, so you say Half Moon Bay. Isn't that where Birds, uh, the, the Hitchcock movie, took place? Or am I wrong about that? I think that that was up in um, like more like Sausalito, but I'm not actually sure. <laughs> okay, so you haven't had any trouble with the birds? I so. haven't been attacked by birds. Yeah, no. And I haven't Nuts. been in Half Moon Bay since March of 2020, let's be clear. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder why that could be. I know, there was like this weird thing that happened at that time. Um, we used to be like partly remote and I'd go into the office twice a week. I live about an hour and 20 minutes south of Half Moon Bay in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And um, now we are a remote first organization. So ISKME is all over the country. Yeah. So many organizations are that way, mine as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it works for me. <laughs> I'm happy to stay in my little corner of the Redwoods and uh, do my work here. I wish mine was. <laughs> well, you know, one of the other things that's kind of nice to do in these meetings is, um, uh, you know, have the other participants um, have a have a moment to to get to know each other a little bit too. In bigger crowds, we um, we often would go to breakout rooms and talk about something specific. But we have so few people here today, right with us now, live. Um, I'm wondering if um, it might make sense. I don't want to like take too much time away from what you want to present, Mindy, but I'm wondering if it might be uh, interesting to hear um, just one little tidbit from each of our, uh, each of the folks who's tuned in today about how they got to open, maybe not the whole story, but what was the one thing that turned you on to the open path? It sounds like for Mindy, it was a stalking experience. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I know, and I, I'll start. I saw maybe... the light. Come on. <laughs> you saw the light. Right? You drank the Kool Aid. Right? <laughs> I love that. Um, and I'll start, and maybe I'll pass the baton. But um, I think the thing that really I got into open through the technology door, I would say, and through the open technology door, like working with universities and museums on technology, it became clear and clear that open technology was going to probably be a better choice. Uh, for those organizations, sustainability, and then also just ethically and everything, it just fit better. And so, uh, you know, being someone who worked on technology in those environments, I uh, I was led down the open path, and, but then that led to all the other open things, right, that are so great. Um, Laura, would you, do you have a, a little story about how you got turned to open? Um, well, my last year of graduate school at Berkeley in 1998, I went to a workshop on how to create web pages uh, and this was back with um, Netscape Composer way back in the day. And to me, I've always just thought about the whole internet is open, you know, so I, I took that workshop and I stayed up literally all weekend just putting everything I'd ever written basically onto the internet because I thought that's what the internet is for. So I'm really excited to have seen, you know, all these these institutional definitions of open arising to protect our rights and to promote the idea of open against uh, nefarious interests. Um, but to me, the internet is just an open space and I love it. Hopefully we can keep it that way. Do you want to pick someone to pass the baton to? Well, there's <laughs> Veronica. I've been interacting with Veronica in the other chat. So hi, Veronica. Hey, everybody. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not super camera ready this morning. Uh, I came to open because I don't like bad technology. And as a faculty member, as a new faculty member, after two or three semesters of switching from you know one uh, commercial publisher's homework system to another, to another, to another, and just getting frustrated and wasting time and wasting my students' time and resources. I was just fed up. So I was very grateful to be able to attend a presentation by Cable Green, where they were talking about open. I was like, oh my gosh, this is very much my jam. Like, this is what I care about. It's accessible and everybody can get it and cost is not a barrier. And, and that that was that galvanizing moment that changed the trajectory of my career and I think my life. Wow. Awesome. I have the honor of working now directly with Cable at Creative Commons. And so he is obviously somebody who's, who's moved a lot of people. Um, I'll so, go. Uh, uh, yeah, wait. So yeah, Jonathan has reported Jonathan in the Bernier. chat. And, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And man has decided to um, abstain and just listen at this point. So I think that leaves you, Rissa. How did you get to open? I was reading Jonathan's again. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got distracted. Um, so I was like, should we read that out loud or should we just leave it in the chat? Um, we could read it out loud. I, I mean, it's lovely. Um, I love the fact that you're a mathematician, Jonathan. So cheers. I like that. Um, 
you know, solidarity. Um, so I got to, oh, I don't know. I was going to say to begin with, I blame Nate, although Nate really didn't, you know, I just want to blame him for something. Um, <laughs> it's always a good idea. It just seemed like the right thing to do. Um, exactly. But then you were talking, Laura, and I was like, actually, I was writing my first web page in 1994, my freshman year of college um, in Unix. And I had the worst web page I think I could have possibly done. Um, <laughs> I think it had a lot of, I like wax rhapsodic about Buffy the Vampire Slayer or something. <laughs> um, but. <laughs> like really ridiculous um i think it actually is on the internet archive unfortunately so don't look it up i don't want you to know um <laughs> no more is gonna find but it maybe you do it. i'm just bit. waiting um mm -hmm. but you know uh it was and so yeah i had your similar ideology that the internet is just open so like when i was first teaching i had a web page through cnm that i just posted all of my teaching stuff up there and then they took that server away um but I guess what I'm really interested in, just to kind of wrap this up quickly, is that the first time I really thought about open as a way to do education, that my students would be part of that and that they would be able to put things up is really with like Robin and Rajiv um, talking about open as an educational method and that, that it's actually important to recognize students as scholars. Great, well, I, that, I really feel like um... We're, we've made a little like group here now where we're like we know we know when we all first posted to the internet <laughs> <laughs> so Mindy you know I didn't want to take away I know that you probably have a whole bunch of stuff in store for us um, <laughs> but now we're all friends yeah um, so take it away okay great thank you I know that part of these um these sessions are about kind of actually using the tools so I don't know if you all have been to OER Commons before or if it's new to you. So I'm going to put the link to it in chat and I'll invite you to go ahead and register um, if you if you like. I'm not going to force you to, but I'm just going to say if you want to follow along at home, you can register and do some of the things that I'm going to show you today. Um, it's just to take a little step back and show you a little bit about where OER Commons comes from. Um, our organization is called ISKME, I-S-K-M-E, and that stands for the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management in Education. It rolls right off the tongue, and um, really, we were founded in 2002, so we're, we're, having, we're celebrating um, our 20th anniversary as an organization. And ISKME was founded to look at, to do social science research around how teachers perform continuous improvement on curriculum over time. Our CEO, Lisa Petrides, was um, really there at the beginning of open licensing at the, the sort of those initial um, documents describing what OER is and all of that. And um, in 2007, through funding from the Hewlett Foundation, we launched OER Commons. So we've been around for a long time. As a digital library, um, I think one of the things that sets OER Commons apart is that it was designed from the outset to support open educational practice. So we have tools kind of embedded in there to help users collaborate with one another and to share easily. We really want to be as platform agnostic as we can. You know, if you find something in OER Commons, take it wherever you need to take it. You want to download something to put it in your LMS, please do. You know, we really don't want to lock you into OER Commons by any means. We want to help you find OER and be able to use it and support that. So right now I'm not logged in. So you can do a lot of things on OER Commons as an anonymous user. You can come here and you can start searching. So maybe I just, I'm teaching a course and I don't know what to use and I wanna see if there's some OER. I can just do a quick search right here on the homepage um, just with a keyword. It'll give me a lot of results. <laughs> so of course that can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, but on the left here are a number of filters that you can use to limit that search. Um, OER Commons is really, you know, pre-K through continuing education. So it, it is a broad, a broad library. Um, and that includes then we have all of these educational standards. So if you're in a K-12 context, you can find resources that are aligned to Common Core or your state's very special flavor of Common Core or et cetera. Um, in, our, in our higher ed context, when we work with um, higher ed library consortia, for example, we use the same tool 
to align resources to transfer course IDs, for example. So if you have a state that has a set of codes for your transfer courses, we can use that same tool to align content that way. Um, but you can also just, you know, limit your search by subject area. This is our first level subject taxonomy. We are librarians, so we do use a lot of library words <laughs> like taxonomy, but um, <laughs> pretty, pretty straightforward. So I can say, okay, I want the, the physics books that have been, or the physics titles that are aligned to physics as a subject and a topic. Um, and now I've gone down to 2,300 resources. I can also limit by education level. So maybe I really only want those community college resources and I can do that. And then material type, um, we'll note here that my, my choices on the left are now delimited by the research results. So there are probably other material types that are supported in OER Commons, but not listed here. But maybe I just know that I really just want a full course. I don't wanna like have to put something together myself. So now I have 27 resources, which is a little bit more manageable. And I can begin to you know review these and look at them. So say I wanted to look at this Open Yale course, and um, this is a landing page for a resource. Um, it has the metadata that we use to describe the resource visible here. You can see the license information as well. And there's a few things that a user can do on, on the resource landing page like this. So the thing is they have to sign in. <laughs> so this is the point. As soon as you want to save something or create something or do anything that kind of writes to the database, you do need to have a log a login and be registered. So I'm going to log in now. And, and I was happily did... discovering that I already have a login. Yay. Good job. Yay. <laughs> and um, if you did create an account today, then you probably have an email in your inbox that you need to use to validate that account. So now that I'm a logged in user and I'm also a super user, so I have like these weird things at the top that I have special powers, but um, but I'm able to leave a comment about a resource. So if I've used it and want to comment so that others can benefit from my experience, I can do that. I can also add star ratings to a resource or additional alignments. We also have um, embedded into OER Commons the Achieve OER rubric. So if I click evaluate, it's going to open that. This was originally designed in K-12, but honestly, I don't think that there is any reason why it is not applicable in higher ed. Um, you can skip the standards one, so just save and go to the next rubric, and it just goes through this rubric where you can have these kind of defined, defined feedback on a, on a resource. It can take a little time, so of course, it's something that people really need to be dedicated to do. But it does really help other users when they come to the site to see how these how these resources have been evaluated. One of the things that we've found in our research is that, particularly in higher ed, it's those peer reviews or what people want to see. They want to understand who's used it, how it worked for them, how are they how are they similar in how they teach the course. Um, some other things that as a user I can do here, I can save it. So if you've created an account and you love the fundamentals of physics too, you click save. And you can save it to your, your items. So as a, as a registered user, you have your own little sandbox where you can organize all the OER that you find. These are all of my folders. Or if you're a member of a group, you can also add a resource to a group. And I'll show you more about what the groups are as well. Um, that's really one of our collaborative spaces. Um, you can also share it on social media. If you are a Google person who uses Google Apps for Education, you can also create an assignment in Google for your students. Um, I'll note also that we interact with all of the learning management systems. So if you have an L, we can do an LTI integration to get the resources again where you need them. Um, if I go click through on this, it's going to pop me out in a new window because they've blocked the iframe, so I'm not going to do that, but um, we do have an iframe on some resources. The idea is not to hide where the resource is coming from, but to let you provide that additional commentary on the resource while you're looking at it. So the, the iframe has those same tools of commenting and evaluating and adding your star ratings to a resource. So that's really kind of just the search, the search tool. Um, I don't know if anyone here is a librarian on the call. They're the only ones that we find that ever click this advanced search button. <laughs> so if you, if you are an advanced searcher, this is the advanced search uh, screen. And it gives you kind of an overview of how we describe resources. You can see what our schema looks like. Um, 
and really delimit your search right at the outset here, including we have a controlled vocabulary around licenses. So you can see um, you can limit your search based on these different licenses as well. Um, but mostly we find that people just do a keyword search like everybody just approaches all search as though it's Google these days. So that's kind of that's kind of what we what we have uh, understood of our users. So I'm going to go back to the home page and now I want to share with you a little bit about groups. The groups feature um, was again designed to kind of support that collaboration. So when we talk about we talk about our different tools um, at ISKME, we have OER Commons, which we think of as like the public library downtown, right? Like it's the big library, it has all the stuff. Um, we think about groups as like the big round tables in a library where everyone can collaborate. When I talk about hubs, those are wings in the library. When I talk about microsites, those are branch libraries. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go, that's, that's the way we think about it. Um, here in the groups, I can um, filter my groups to look specifically for higher ed. So maybe I'll go for community college groups and see what we have here. Anybody can create a group on OER Commons if you're a registered user. So you just click create a group and you're off to the races. Um, there's a couple of things you need to name it, for example. I don't know if it's the my that's all caps or the fest. So I think I got it backwards. Um, <laughs> you can say- It's actually the M-Y-F yes, or I'm all capital. I did get it back. Oh, M-Y-F, okay. Yeah, because it's mid-year festival. Ah. <laughs> Not that, I mean, I don't want to be the, you know- Oh no, I wanted to know. Branding police. <laughs> Um, you can say, you know, who is this group for? Describe your group. Um, so maybe, you know, if you have a specific discipline area that you're focusing on, or maybe it's all of them and you just click all of them, you can also say what your level is. Really, this is um, just meant for these drop downs at the top so that folks can kind of filter the groups and find the group that, that's going to help meet their needs. Um, So with a group, you can also say this group is open to anyone. Like I want to invite the whole world to my group and we can all curate OER together. Or you can actually say, no, not really. <laughs> I would like to say who's going to be in my group because we're, we're working on a project together. Maybe it's a faculty grantee group that are working for a specific project. They can decide who, um, who will be in their group. And then I've done it. I've created a group. I'm all alone in it. But um, once you've created the group, you can create your own folders. So you have, you know, a lot of times you're going to have your own way of thinking about your resources and your and your organization of them that maybe is not aligned to how we describe resources on OER Commons. So you can create a folder structure on the left and invite people to your group, have threaded discussions, and really just sort of work together there. Um, I'm going to jump over now to the hubs, the wings in the library, just to show you all, um, because we're sort of in a higher ed context here, I wanted to just use the open textbooks hub to show you a little bit about the hubs. Um, I will note we have about 50 hubs on OER Commons, and um, we service um, K-12 higher ed, as I mentioned. We also have UNESCO and Alexo, so some NGOs in there. Some are specific projects, some are like the whole system, it just really is a wide array of different um, use cases. And um, I think it just reflects the flexibility of this tool. You know, it's part of OER Commons, but it's also a space where an organization can highlight their work, can validate and share specific resources with their users, um, and can also develop communities of practice. So I'm going to go to the Open Textbooks Hub, which is one that ISKME created because we found, you know, a lot of people were coming to OER Commons because they searched for free textbooks. And they were like, oh, well, we have those here. So let's look at them. So this is a hub. It's kind of a landing page. And um, what we've done here is we've created curated collections of the open textbooks that we have in these discipline areas. So if anyone says to me, I can't find OER, my head like, because we've really done a lot of work here to make it findable. <laughs> So um, here are full textbooks in all of these course areas, as well as collections that are by provider. So these are the collect, these are the content creators, right? So you'll see OpenStax and Open Oregon, folks that are making these books. Um, I added Pressbooks this morning. Obviously, they are not the content creator, but they are a platform that everyone knows and trusts. And so ISKME did a lot of work to index um, from the directory all of the press books that we could find. We, we that actually were actual full textbooks. So right now we have 821 press books indexed on OER Commons. And you know, it's just going to take you to the press books page. We're not, you know, 
we're not trying to to do anything funky with it it's just going to take you right there and um, unless of course it's going to go there it goes <laughs> and uh, and then you're in right so here i can show you the iframe again it's just a way to um, add your commentary and information you can see the direct link to this resource here um so we have done a lot of work to kind of just make these findable bring them bring them up for folks who are looking for um for these books so that is the press books collection but really just this is our higher ed kind of collections of resources knowing that in higher ed often folks are looking for full textbooks rather than individual resources although there are certainly those here as well hey mindy can i ask you a question there of course so when um you know like in that example of a, of a press book that you just showed does the the information from the book actually get copied over to oer commons or is it a reference to it? no so it's really it's just a reference um probably 75 percent of the resources on oer commons are linking out to other content sources so we really are a library in the sense that we're just creating records of these resources to make them findable um that said we do have an authoring tool which i'll show you where you can create resources in oer commons um but a lot of it is just that we've indexed it and point out to the site great so it's sort of a both end situation yeah that's yes. great yes um i do have this open textbook working group so if any of you are interested in joining a group that already exists and you want to be a part of this um, i invite you to to join us this is an open group um, and if you have things that you're working on or you want to share, you can do that. Um, looks like we have very few resources, but a lot of members. So, <laughs> you know, keeping these kind of groups active and vibrant uh, takes a lot of moderation that, you know, ISME is a very small team. So we encourage folks to kind of take the, take the bull by the horns and, and get in there. Um, so I'm going to go back to some of the other hubs to share with you. I think one other really strong example for this group is the OpenStax hub. Um, we are we're close friends with OpenStax, and uh, they came to us saying they had all of these people who have adopted their textbooks and are out there creating all of these wonderful like PowerPoints and data sets. And they were like, how do we share it back? You know, they wanted to do open educational practice, but they had no mechanism to do that. So the goal of this hub is to create that space for the OpenStax community. So they have their groups for Creator Fest here, but what they've also done is created a group for each of their titles. And they took their adopters and they invited them to these groups to participate and to contribute the things that they're working on and creating. So this is one of our most active hubs on OER Commons. Um, partly, you know, OpenStax had, this is part of their work and they certainly have connections with their users, so ability to reach out to them and get them involved in this work. So, so this is where folks are sharing back what they've created. Um, you can see this is an example of how they've created their own folder taxonomy to describe and to organize content. Um, but also the nice thing about a hub is it's not just those groups or just those collections, but it's also just a nice way to share information to your to folks who are interested in your work, um, you can create announcements and share data, uh, share information. Um, here's a little bit about the OpenStax mission, helping, you know, they have their nice, like, how to contribute, things like that. So this is just things that, as a hub owner, they're able to add this content that they create themselves. I'm not keeping up at all in the chat, so if there's anything there, like, just wave at me or something. And oh, it's, it's mostly it's a bunch chat, of- right? Yeah. <laughs> It's a bunch of fall de roll and fiddle dee dee. Although I did, <laughs> I did share a link to the my fest groups that you made, which I've already joined. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm sorry, I've requested. I requested. Oh, did I? That's right. I made it closed. I'll open it up. Sorry. <laughs> um. So yeah, there's you know many groups here, and one of the things that I like about this, um, you know, the hubs are open to anyone to view. So it's not. I think it's really a nice tool for like building on the work of others, which is such an important part of open um, to go in and see what other folks have done and to, to benefit from their curation work or their, their creations. Um, I, I really, one of my favorite hubs to show is this Nordic University Health Hub, which I know is a super niche kind of topic, but um, it started with just three universities in Scandinavia, and now they have 12, and they are sharing these videos they created all about global public and health. So it's really cool um, videos there in English, because there's, you know, I think like four or five countries represented here. Um, but they've done a nice job of curating their resources into these collections. 
Um, one thing people ask a lot is what's the difference between a group and a collection? And I'll just say a collection is really typically a set of resources that's been curated by a subject matter expert or a librarian. So they're really kind of a fully baked grouping of resources that are kind of a top down um, just assortment of them, right? Whereas a group is like a free for all. So we, the, the five of us could go in and create, are there six of us? <laughs> we could all go in and create a group right now and start curating resources and we can have nice collections that we create in our folders, but it's a little bit more kind of from the bottom up, right? A little more grassroots um, approach. So um, that is the hubs. Now I'm going to shift over to tell you how you can contribute to OER Commons which is this nice add OER button. There are two ways to add OER to OER Commons. So you can provide us with a link. So maybe you have a Google site or you have a, another website on your, on, your, on, your, on your page at your school um, and you just wanna make sure that we can make it findable. So you would say that you wanna add a link. And um, if anyone has a URL, I can throw that in here. Otherwise I'll, I'll find something that I can use. Um, Usually I'm like, well, what is some random Google Doc I have open? Um, <laughs> oh, Veronica provided an example. Okay, let's see. It may not be a Google Doc, but. No, that's all right, that's great. If it's not already in there, we'll do it. Okay, so we put the link in here. That's not it. <laughs> we'll <laughs> it put some link right. in. I know, right? Okay. It doesn't let you index yourself. Okay, I need HTTP, okay. Yeah. This is where being a librarian comes in oh, handy. I'm, I'm <laughs> Mindy, I'm so sorry. I set you up for failure there. You I did, the didn't correct, you? <laughs> I put the correct link in the in the chat. That's on me, everybody. Okay. Mindy is an impeccable professional. That's me. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. It's okay. <laughs> the fact that okay. humans have to get URLs. Let's correct try again. Is, there we um, go. Okay. Here we are. We made it. Okay, so you can see here it did a little pre-population of the um, of this page. So I put the URL in. It checks the system to see if it's already there. So if this if we already had it, it wouldn't let me do it again, right? There's so there's not going to be duplicates in that way. Um, so this is an information about the organization. I should probably go take a look at it since I'm adding it. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay. So what we want to do next is we want to say who the authors are. Now, I don't know if that makes sense in this context, but uh, maybe you can tell me, Veronica, if there's a specific person that I should list. Maybe it's you. Well, it, it's a group, but I mean, sure, put me. I'll okay. take that credit. Um, so with submitting a resource like this, where you have an external link, um, you know, you're basically attributing the resource to, to an author. Um, if you're creating something in open author, which I'll show you in a moment, then you're, you're the author and you, you don't have to add that information. And the next step is the conditions of use. And so um, we have all of our favorite Creative Commons licenses here, as well as I don't see any of these, which is a lot of people <laughs> don't see them. So um, if you don't know what these mean, uh, this group probably already does. You just click on it and you can see what this is, as well as a link out to tell you more information about the link, about the license. So we want to make it really clear. We put this iconography all over the place because we want people to see it and recognize it. Um, makes it a lot easier for them to do that kind of uh, license detail. And now I need to go and see what the license is on this one. Which <laughs> So we've got a CC BY. Okay. So now hey. I can CC by boom. I love um, it when a resource has its license clearly marked. Yeah, right. When you don't have to like go to the terms of use and dig it yeah. down, dig in there. So I'm going to put this probably under education, just broadly. I it probably could do better, but um, because I don't want to spend my entire time doing this description for you all live, I'm going to go kind of rush through it a little bit. Um, education level, I think we'll call this uh, graduate professional material type. Let's see. We will call this a teaching and learning strategy. We're gonna say it's in English. Oops. And that's really the required metadata for a resource on OER Commons. Now you can give us a lot more and we appreciate it when you do. So you could align it to a standard if that made sense in this context, it doesn't really um, until we get our OER standards. <laughs> um, media format, I'm gonna call this text in HTML. Educational use, professional development. 
the primary user. Let's see, we can have more than one here. So I think we've probably got a librarian would use this, an administrator would use this, teacher. I think this is also a demonstration that ISME needs to update our metadata controlled vocabulary so they are not so K-12 focused. Um, I can leave out grades. Accessibility is um, something that our users struggle with and something that uh, in this context is not a great place to be adding metadata, to be honest. So um, I'm gonna leave that blank, but um, know that ISKME works closely with the organization called CAST, and we are, have done a lot of research with them to think about how better to add accessibility metadata to resources, understanding that maybe it's something you do more granularly with a resource as you work through it, um, knowing that teachers really think about it in terms of accommodations more than accessibility. So there's a lot of levels of accessibility. And um, if you are interested, we're gonna be doing some professional learning with CAST this fall that we're offering for free around accessibility. So stay tuned. Um, I can also add tags. So if there's just you know some, some additional keywords that I wanna add because this resource is specific about behavior analysis, for example. So I could just say maybe behavior is a is a, a tag that I want, if I could spell it, that I wanna add here. So you could add that. If you're using it in a course for yourself, you could add that course number. So the, the keyword tags are really free form for you to add whatever information you want. Next, I click continue and here I am. I can see what it looks like. This cover image will automatically be replaced with a screenshot if I don't upload something. Um, but you can see the metadata here. And once I feel confident in this, I can submit it for review. Now, because of my account, I can just submit it and it's gonna be, it's gonna already be in there. <laughs> but anyone else who adds a resource is going to have it go to our librarians and they'll take a look at it, make sure the license is correct. And um, they're not checking like the quality of the content. We're not that subject matter expertise, but um, they will make sure that it's openly licensed and that it's, you know, fits within OER common submission guidelines. And then we've added a resource. Yes, do you have a question? Uh, I do, thank you. Um, a question about that review. This was some time ago, so my memory could be pretty faulty, but it felt like that took a fair bit of time. What What would you say, if you know, is the amount of time somebody might want to prepare or plan that it will take for a resource to be approved and to appear in the commons? It should be 24 to 48 hours. Um, we have two librarians working on it. If you are a member of a hub, then you actually are a trusted user and can actually just publish. Um, so there's some kind of, you know, we have some levels there. And also, I mean, I have the power to make people trusted users as well, but um, it's, yeah, so it's something that, you know, really, we have a lot of issues with spam, as I'm sure you can imagine. So we really had to start kind of locking it down a little bit more tightly to make sure that, um, that we controlled what was being added, so. All right, thank you. Um, OER Commons has done a lot of work indexing resources from the Open Textbook Library, so that is that's why they're there. We we go out and find OER all the time, so you know it doesn't take every individual adding their own private personal creations. Um, we're there doing a lot of curation, and a lot of curation comes out of these hubs. You know, when we bring on a new partner, and they're like, "Wait, we need all of these titles," so we'll go and we'll get them. Um, I know we're kind of getting up to time here, but I just want to show you Open Author. Um, Open Author is a built into OER Commons as a way to create and publish OER. It is not like Pressbooks. You're not going to create like this full, beautiful website textbook thing. So I, I want to be clear on that, but it is a very nice, easy way to create new and share new resources. Sometimes if you have a PowerPoint and you just want to share that, you may put it in open author with a little bit of framing in this main content window, and that may be your whole resource. But some folks, you know, actually create whole things in here. Um, you can create, you add your title, so you can have an image, and then you have basically a series of sections. So this could be my introduction, and now I'm here in the main content window. Now, if I've been spending all of my time working on this in Google Drive, I don't have to like rewrite it. I can import from Google Drive, I can import from Microsoft OneDrive, or I can copy and paste from other places. I will note that tables are quite a bugaboo. <laughs> so you might wanna recreate your tables. I think that's true everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but once you've done that, you know, you can, you have a nice, easy WYSIWYG editor here at the top. 
Again, you can copy and paste. Um, we have a styles menu, which is really important for um, accessibility. Some lightweight formatting here. Um, you can also embed images, tables, videos, um, math, and, and glossary terms. So there's, a, there's some you know, support for like sort of higher level or science um, content. This is an accessibility checker. So if I, last time I tried to do this, I couldn't find my resource, which is why I was hesitating to do this, but I'm gonna try it anyway. Um, to, to Nothing like a live the demo for fun, right? I know, right? It's like, keeps it interesting. Um, this is not the one that I wanted, so. Whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm just gonna use it. Hopefully it's nothing weird. <laughs> we'll see, we shall see. <laughs> well, the reason I want to do it is because if you create something someplace else, so this was feedback for on open author from someone. If you create something from someone else, it's even more important to run the accessibility checker because you probably weren't thinking about that. So it's gonna go through your resource and tell you what you need to do to make it more accessible. For example, this image doesn't have any alt text, right? So mm -hmm. in and out of the mitochondria. Uh, so I can add that and quick fix it and remediate as I go. And so it will just nice. go through all of these and give me an opportunity to fix it right there um, to make sure that my resource is gonna be more accessible. Now for each of these sections, I can also attach a file. So that may be a URL, that may be a PowerPoint, that may be a data set, that may be an anchor text. I don't know what it's gonna be, but you can attach it. And that will follow that section of the resource. Um, you can also have instructor notes. So if you wanted to provide some, some tips for using this resource or maybe some strategies for teaching this with different kinds of learners, you can put that in here. It's also a nice place if you find yourself remixing a resource to say your rationale for the remixes that you made. Um, and then I can just do that over and over again with as many sections as I want. And so you can see, and now I've created a new section we have some things with up to 20 sections and you can reorder them and folks can come in and change it. So now, um, like the cooking show, I'm gonna pull my pie out of the oven and show you an authored resource. Now, what I'm gonna show you is a little bit different because um, it's actually a full course. And so we do have the power to create courses on OER Commons, which is going to sequence all of those lessons into units. It's something that ISKME has to set up for you on the back end, and then you can go in and add your content. So it's not fully front end ready, but um, I did work with an educator at Austin Community College who wrote this uh, textbook on Texas government. And, um, and he put all of this content in for me. So you can see basically a unit kind of aligning to a chapter. And then within that, all of those lessons are kind of like those subheads in the chapter, right? So. If I go into lesson two of unit six, here I am, the relationship between the local, state, and national government, and I can go through and get through these boring pages and get to the good stuff here. Hey, Mindy, and how granular is the, the ability to add uh, different licenses in that structure? So really, it is, you know, like you can see here with this image that he has the right. attribution there. So um, one thing that we're looking at for future iterations is to have... Um, more of that as you go through. But right now, a lot of folks kind of create a, a lesson or a section at the end of a lesson that lists their attributions. And so gotcha. when you license the whole thing, I'm, you know, it's it's not going to be a culmination of what's inside of it, if that makes sense. Sure, but like at what um at what level of that hierarchy is the light can one apply at the lesson at, level. At the lesson level. Lesson level. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So in this lesson, here I am, I can see across the top how I can navigate between the different sections of this course. And then um, on the left, I can save it just like I showed you before. I could save it to my items. I could save it to a group. I can rate it, download it, share it, Google Classroom it, <laughs> print it, align it. And then here I can add tags. I can remix it. I can comment. So if I click to remix it, I'm back in that editing view. And now I can reorder these sections or I could be like, you know, that was a really weird experience going through these learning objectives and intros. So maybe I want to put those into a single section together. And in remixing it, I'm creating a new version. The original author will be notified and they will be linked together as versions. So we'll all that will be visible to users as well. Um, 
So that is really what authoring looks like. And then let me go back real quick because I just wanted to show you one other thing about that, which is the um, download functionality for these. So if I click to download a, a, this lesson, I have a lot of different ways I can download it. So I have an EPUB 3 download, which could just be the student view or it could include the instructor notes. Um, we worked closely with CAST to ensure that that was accessible, particularly for the math. Um, we also have PDF downloads and then thin common cartridge and SCORM. So those are the ones that you can download and then import into your learning management systems if you're not using an LTI integration. So again, get it where you need it. We're not trying to hold it. We want you to take it and go use it. Right. Um, so that is um, the, the full <laughs> the full feature set of OER wow. comments. Um, really D done very <laughs> efficiently. I do want to just show you briefly. Um, I'm going to show you an example of a microsite. Um, so okay, we were... and, and while you're pulling that up, sorry, Mindy, there's there were a couple of quick questions. Oh yeah, sorry. Too. Um, one was uh, from Laura. If there's a lot of remixing going on. Do you know the degree to which remixing happens? Yeah, so you know, I think we see it um, with individual smaller resources. We see a lot of it in K-12. Um, in higher ed, I don't really know actually at this point how much remixing is happening. You know, with uh, it has to be for us to see it, it has to be in open author. So right. first you have to have the content developed in open author and then you have to remix it. So right. um, we haven't seen a ton of that, but I will say, you know, we imported the full text of a number of OpenStax courses, and um, I do see those getting a lot of use and remixing so that we've tried to make that really easy for folks to update those courses. Um, but I don't have any specific data. I and saw that, someone cheered Austin Community College, so I decided to show Texas instead of uh, Viva. <laughs> nice. One other quick question, and I think you, you, you uh, put out a metaphor about the difference between hubs and groups, probably library-based metaphor. Can you remind us of that? Ron, yes, so hubs okay. are, okay, so OER Commons, big library downtown, hubs, sponsored wings in the library. So it's like, oh, this is the climate education wing, or oh, this is the Michigan Colleges Online wing. Groups are our big tables for collaborating with one another in the library. So that's it. And then my branch library, would be this OER Texas. It's a big branch. And uh, within the branch libraries, they have all of the same things. So they have hubs and they have groups and they have their, there's definitely going to be some overlap of their resource collections because, you know, one of the reasons I think people like to work with us is that we can give them a library that's full of content, right? We can move things over from OER Commons and give them something that's fleshed out, but then they can go in and begin to do the work of bringing in materials from their own institutions, inviting folks to become a part of their community. Um, so this is the Texas repository and uh, we're doing a ton of work in Texas right now. Um, they, they have created hubs for their institutions. So if you go in here, we're just starting to do sort of onboarding sessions with their hub, with their institutions to say, this is what a hub is. This is why you want it. Let's get started. But Austin and San Jacinto have really already started doing this work to create their hubs. So you can see here, this is an institutional hub on OER Texas. Um, I'll stop in two minutes. I'm going to say one last thing, which is that we are working on refactoring our, in, our infrastructure so that Texas and OER Commons and Viva and Lewis and Ohio Link and CUNY and all of our microsite partners can share collections. So we call it the OER Exchange. And basically as an administrator of OER Texas, I could say, this Austin Community College collection is the bomb. I want to share it with everybody and I make it available on the exchange. And then Viva can say, I want that and they can add it to their microsite as well. So that's that's our phase one of kind of networking all of these sites and making making it so that everybody can share more easily. Right now it's like, well, I can download a CVS and CSV and then I can put it in yours is kind of the workflow. Next step after that, we are working in an IMLS grant right now that will be to, to expand that so that it's not just ISKME's microsites and OER Commons, but it's also a LibreText and Merlot or whatever repositories you have, maybe your homegrown Oklahoma repository that you can then share on an open metadata exchange where we can all be sharing these resources together. So again, not breaking silos down, but connecting them. <laughs> so that's really the direction that we want to go. We want to make this something where we're networking all of this OER so everybody can find everything all the time and, and keep it, you know, we want to make that an open source tool that's available broadly. So 
that's the direction that we want to go. Wow, that's really Boom. amazing. <laughs> I learned a lot. I learned a, a ton here today. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, I don't think Laura wants to take any responsibility for any Oklahoma repositories anymore. <laughs> I think she's moved on. So, um, do you know we have a couple more minutes? Um, do folks have other questions? Maybe just go ahead and unmute and, and ask your question if yeah. you want, or put it in the text if if you would prefer not to be live. Mm -hmm. Veronica's raising her hand. I have a question. Um, the analogy of the hubs versus groups versus branch library, it is helpful, I think, if you are a librarian, that is going to probably ring really true. Sadly, I am not. And, and, <laughs> and that is, you know, that's on me. I took the wrong path in life. I see that. <laughs> but with that being said, um, what a wonderful opportunity for like community building and getting folks together and making it like a little bit more transparent and easy to find what you need. I'm just not really sure. Can, would you be willing to tell us a little bit more about how might a group or a person, how how might you begin one of those? Do you do you have to do you have to have librarian cred to create a hub or uh, what what are those what so, are those different groups like? Yeah, so you know our partners for hubs um, are pretty wide ranging, and it's certainly not not coming out entirely out of libraries. Sometimes it is um, in K twelve. It's like a regional service unit that says like we are doing this OER and we want the state to do it, and they sort of start it and. Um, UNESCO is certainly not librarians, but they're reaching out to their member states to do it. But we've also seen um, it's just individuals who are doing this work, you know, it's the advocates on the ground. So, you know, it's that's, I think, really where the groups feature is nice because it doesn't we charge for hubs, but anybody can create a group. Right. So you can say, like, I know these three other faculty people and I want to work with them, you know, and so you can just create a group and invite them to your group and set your goal for it and begin reviewing resources together. You know, it doesn't, there's, it's really easy. It doesn't take any expertise to do that. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that fully That's answered your question, but my, my whole, just get in there and do it is really <laughs> my answer. <laughs> yeah. If I might have a follow-up question, because these sure. tools seem so useful, so helpful for folks who are doing a lot of that you know, maybe you're a pioneer in your specific area and look at the, the the possibility for networking, right? That's what the commons really brings is that beautiful network. Yeah. If folks wanted to learn more about that, you know, about how to leverage these to make good communities or once you're in a group, how do how do different groups work? And, and yeah. where would a person go for like some additional support or training? So we do professional learning around all of that. Um, we do it as a component of our hubs work, but also just on its own. And also we have a, we have a hub for that. <laughs> We have an open edu well, so we have the open educational practice in action hub and this um, is really sort of resource collections around you know advocating for OER doing doing all of this work um, sharing and collaborating so these are just going to be resources about it you know it's it's very meta um, we have an open educational practice rubric to help educators as well um, we also have um, communities of practice here doing this work. So you can reach out to folks and ask questions. And then we have um, the virtual academy specifically around the OER Commons tool set. So you can go in there and, and find some materials to help guide you. There's also you know, a, help, a help center with, with knowledge base of, of articles as well. Um, additionally, if you're interested in the professional learning that OER Commons offers, there's a hope for that too. We have the professional learning hub. So this is something that I just built this a few months ago and it talks about our professional learning work, how we approach it, starting with open educational practice and kind of the foundational work of OER. And one thing that I'm super excited about is how you can build on that. And now we're doing, now that we all know what OER is, let's talk about how we can use it for culturally responsive teaching or how we can use it for accessibility. And then my future hope, how we can do it for climate literacy. So how we can kind of use OER as a launching point to, to address all of these different needs and, and different lenses of evaluating curriculum. Great. Hey, Mindy, uh, we got a couple other hands up here, but I know that we're also right at close to the end of our time. Do you have a couple extra minutes to yeah, run over? Absolutely. Great. Well, I do too. So uh, I think we can keep this open. Um, 
And I think uh, Rissa actually had her hand up first. I'm I'm really asking clarification questions though. So if okay. Laura has a question that is like, actually maybe the discussion for it, <laughs> I'll let her go first. You're gonna cede your time to the, the gentlewoman cede, from Texas. I want my time back. So I want to cede <laughs> my time temporarily. Wait, 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 later. Well, I've got a, a question about something we haven't talked about and it's just kind of morbid curiosity, but I'm wondering how much you learn and study the searches that people do, like, for example, common core standards, how much do people filter on that? And because that would say influence my work, knowing how much they filter on that. I hate common core standards, but if people <laughs> are filtering on that, I'd like to know. So I don't think that they do it very much. Um, what I can tell you is that um, when a, in K-12, if an educator, you know, they obviously have standards to meet if every term in a year. And so they may be looking for a specific alignment tag, but um, I think it's more about that reporting piece for them to go up to administrators and say, this resource was aligned to this standard and I used it that way. I don't think they're often, they're not often checking specifically for that. It may be different when we're talking about um, a microsite. So let's go, for example, um, you know, Michigan has done a lot of um, training, actually we have too in, in North Carolina around how to align resources to standards. So North Carolina's microsite has a requirement that everything you add is aligned to a standard. So when you pull a resource up, you can see what it's aligned to right there. So you may not be searching for that, but you can see what it's aligned to. Uh, Michigan has also done that kind of curriculum evaluation um, to align resources to standards, to train teachers how to do that work. So, you know, it's an important thing for K-12 educators to be able to see how it aligns, but I don't think that they're like really driving in and looking at these standards and searching for them specifically. But we do have the data. <laughs> so we, we can certainly pull that information. Okay, I guess I'm reclaiming my time now. <laughs> Unless Laura has a follow-up question. You look like you were ready. Okay. Um, so, I'm a little confused between all of these different moments. So if yeah. I wanted to build a textbook, for instance, yeah. what you were saying is that the editor is pretty simple. So you'd rather do that like on Pressbooks or probably something else and then import it into here. Um, but if I wanted to build like a, a curated course that was open that I could share with other people, that might be better done here because that would be a curation that I could add instructor resources to and what have you. Is that kind of the gist? Am I getting that right? Or is that like not really at all? What so there's many about? ways that you can create a course. Um, I would say if you have a Pressbooks account and you know the full end-to-end -end course that you want to create, like have at it. But um, you can also do it here um, with less with the lesson uh, with Open Author. Mm -hmm. Or you could say, send a support ticket and say, I want to create a whole course. And then we would set up, like, ask you for your outline and create the framework. And then you would put your content into those lessons. Some okay. people, they create a group and they use the folders and that's what they do. And that's their course. Okay. The so like, okay. So there's so many different ways to skin that cat. Um, sorry. Okay. Cat. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I'm just wondering. I, I'm just wondering if we, if we, you wanted to go. I mean, this is kind of the the context between the questions, right? Is that what if I wanted to kind of no longer use an LMS? Yeah. But have and be tied to one institution. How do I do that in in kind of the most straightforward way? so that I could also share with other people. It, I, I'm getting the sense that the OER is the library. So you might wanna go through the OER commons um, just to kind of get a, a large um, group of people who could be, I could share this too, mm -hmm. um, but I might wanna create that content, at least like the text, like bookie type content somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, my the reason I said, I, the reason, I would suggest, you know, not writing directly into open author. Like I would say you want to have a source of truth that's a different document and then pull it into there, right? Because just yeah. for your own yeah. records, right? Um, right. Now having it associated with your institution, 
without the LMS, I mean, I'm not sure that that OER Commons answers that need for you, unless you wanted to make that like the name of your group or something. There's no specific affiliation unless you're using a microsite, maybe. Um, right. And also, right. I'll note okay. that there's no assessment piece here. So there's no place no. Yeah. in here for students to provide like feedback or responses. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, I, my my thought was I don't use the LMS for assessment anyway. So we're not talking, <laughs> we're talking learning tools. Um, but if you could create it on different pieces and then pull it in and have a curated something, mm -hmm. then that might be very helpful to be able to, especially if you're looking towards maybe moving yeah. institutions or you have multiple institutions oh, you yeah. have to teach at or whatever, yeah. that creating it in a general place um, and then being willing to share that with whomever because it's OER, yeah. that might be a very nice way to go. Totally, totally. And, uh, you know, we work with Ohio Link and um, they had done all of this grantee work to develop courses and they used Open Author and they were really faculty facing courses with a lot of links like, okay, go to this chapter here and do this. And, and, and now that, you know, OER has kind of evolved a little bit, they're finding that their faculty really just want like, collections of resources they may choose from. So we're talking about actually developing hubs for those courses at, in Ohio mm -hmm. and then you know having collections of resources covering specific topics that they can use while still offering the full course but giving them more flexibility in how to organize those content the content. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm hoping for is instead of a collection really doing a course hub. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or you could just be like, hey, like, this here's is all the organic. stuff. Here are some suggested right. differences. <laughs> this is organic chemistry one. Yeah. I'm not really sure. I care about the standards that are yeah. <laughs> with that yeah. on my list, them, but you know, like here's all of the all stuff that I would put in there. there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I kind of like that. So thank you for helping me think through that. Of course. There was a question about adding educational standards. Right. It's yeah. a service that we offer. So we basically ask you to put them into a spreadsheet that we give you, and then we bring them in. Um, one of the things that is gonna come out of our new infrastructure is the ability to update those standards once they're in in the admin panel. So, because right now it's, it's kind of an onerous process, but uh, yeah. And is that usually something that like the standards, the body that issues the standards itself might? take a lead on or um in k-12 you know they're state standards so they're the ones that they they will format them and then pay for us to bring them some states work with like it's what's now in structure was academic benchmarks and so we work with them and their apis to bring them in um but then in higher ed um like let's go lewis has their um course catalog so they have like course alignment their common course catalog and then they did the same thing, put it into the spreadsheet, and here I can go, okay, I want your anthro, I want everything that is aligned to intro to anthropology, here's my four options. Hmm. So that's kind of just another way that we've used the same tool. So Veronica, I don't know, maybe if that gives you a, maybe it's, yeah, <laughs> thumbs up, you got it. <laughs> awesome. Great. Well, we seem to have run out of questions. Uh, I'm so happy that we managed to actually conduct this meeting yeah. <laughs> because it was so vibrant and, and lively, um, popping, coming from all around. Um, thank you so much, Mindy. Is there anything else that you wanted to leave us with as a parting gift? Um, no, just that it's free and open for all forever. So please go and create your OER Commons account and get in there and start just playing with the tools and doing some searches. and. Um, if you want to reach out to me for any follow-up questions or thoughts, um, I'm putting my email in chat. And um, we, you know, we're we're here to be to help grow the community, so we want to be a part of that with y'all. So thank you for the opportunity, Nate, to to do the session. Well, yes. thank you again so much for coming, and everybody who somehow managed to to find the registration link yeah. for the session, <laughs> you win the prize. Thank you. thank you all. Have a great day.